This podcast is part of the Garnet Media Group Podcast Network. Garnet Media Group is a partnership between the student-run media outlets at the University of South Carolina. Find out more about Garnet Media's podcast and other student work at garnetmedia.org. Good morning, Gamecocks. I'm Chloe Finley. And I'm Megan Douchus. We're back for the summer, giving you a recap on the news and happenings on the USC campus and around Columbia. I'm Caroline Smith, and we hope you're enjoying our summer podcast edition of Good Morning Gamecocks. And I'm Delaney Flanagan. This week, USC launched a new app that should make it easier to park on campus this fall. Some former Gamecocks are prepping to take on the Olympics later this summer. The Murdoch family is back in South Carolina news. And it's hot outside, and some unwelcome visitors may be sharing our beaches for this 4th of July. We hope to get your weekend started in the right direction. Welcome to Good Morning Gamecocks. Welcome back, everybody, to the Good Morning Gamecocks podcast. We're happy to have you here. We have a secret. Wait, Chloe has a secret. Because Chloe has, has a secret for Absolutely us. diabolical. What, right is, what are you talking she's just about? Not telling anybody. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have any secrets. She about has... five minutes ago, Chloe came. The viewers at home can't see this, but we're on like a Zoom call, and Chloe just walked into the frame with the biggest glass of milk <laughs> we've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it's, a, it's a very normal sized glass of milk. It's a normal glass. glass. Nobody ever drinks a full glass of milk. (laughs) (laughs) That's like half the gallon. (laughs) No, that's like, that's like, it's good for your bones. It's got calcium and stuff in it. (laughs) Anyway, Gamecocks, we've got some stories for you to help you kick off your weekend, starting with a new phone app that may help with one of the worst aspects of campus. It looks like parking on campus may be easier thanks to a new app launched by USC Parking and Transportation. So this new app, it's called Park USC, and it basically just allows you to see all the available parking on campus before you actually like arrive on campus. It also can save your parking spot so you remember it, like you can like mark where you parked and then you don't forget. And it also tells you, ideally it tells you if you're at risk for a citation, based on the permits that the app knows that you have and your location and like the parking garage you're in. Parking and transportation services can send out announcements and updates like through the app. So if you have your notifications on, you can get it and you can leave feedback. So if you think the parking garage you're in is gross and dark and stinky, you can um, leave, uh, leave feedback. I do lovingly refer to Pendleton Street Garage as gross, yucky Pendleton. So (laughs) I'm going to like the feedback option. I also like the it remembers where your car is i actually have an air tag in my car because i forget where i leave it in parking lots it's really embarrassing when you go to find your car and it's not where you thought it was and you just end up walking around and looking a little silly like how do you lose something that big (laughs) apparently it's pretty easy because i'm sure we've all done it yeah i always think i know where it is and then i walk out and i'm like "Uh, oh (laughs) not here so the app also prides itself on being quote user friendly And this is where I become a little skeptical because I downloaded the app and I had a rough time. (laughs) Oh, I was, I didn't know what was going on. (laughs) (laughs) So it is still in its like pilot phase. So it's still being tested. Um, Only the lots on, I think like West campus are being used right now. So that's 81, 8016, Divine West and Greek Village. Um, and they're just kind of working out the kinks, trying to see if it'll work for our campus. And I also am in Raleigh, North Carolina right now, so it doesn't, the location is not really working so good. So I think the reason that I had a hard time is not necessarily the app's fault, but it was also just like, when I went to go click the university that I stayed at, University of South Carolina was just not listed. It's not an option. I'm actually on the app right now trying to set it up. And there are like five other schools, one of which is LSU, which makes sense because the LSU are like our parking director. We got him from LSU. This was probably his idea, wasn't it? Yeah. So he, Brian Favela is his name. And he he got hired from LSU to come to USC and deal with all our parking problems because Lord knows we got him. Um, (laughs) he basically, I, I think that he was, he worked in parking on LSU's campus while they were setting up this app there and kind of 
helped work out the kinks on their end, which is pretty good. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I have faith. I think at the very least it's a good experiment. And if it works, I, I will be happy. Cause That's crazy. We literally stole a basketball championship, a parking director, and an app from LSU. That's, cool. That's crazy. How am I getting rewards points for being for parking? That's the other thing is that there's a reward system that I did some research and could not figure out how it worked. But <laughs> maybe. why? Why? How? I I have a lot of questions. Mainly being, well? how do you get rewards from parking? Like, oh, you didn't hit someone. Plus five. What? That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> I wonder if you can, like, can you redeem the points? Like, do you get free parking if you have a certain amount of points? The like, bar is so parking... low. Are you kidding me? You get points for not hitting someone? I, wonder... I get to park in Bull Street for free for a day when I correctly make a right turn with a turn signal. <laughs> I wonder if it's anything on terms, because I know that the Passport Parking app does this in my town, but not in Columbia, where if you end your session early... You get that money refund, and so I wonder if it's something like that. If you get the points back, you get, you know, free amount of points to add to your next parking space um, for minutes-wise. That That's would be nice. pretty nice. But the thing is, is, like, I feel like USC parking garages, like, at least, I mean, I if I'm on campus, I'm usually parking in a metered spot. But if I park at Bull Street, it's, like, by hour. So you're not prepaying. So that's where I'm, like, a little skeptical, like, how does this work? I have a pass. Like, I, I have lived, I live on the horseshoe, and I have, like, pretty much my whole time in college, so I've always, like, had a garage pass, which we're not going to talk about how much that costs, but, like, how does this, does this benefit you, like, only if you're a commuter? Does it do metered spots only? I think it's mostly the actual, like, university parking lots and garages. Because I feel like a lot of the metered spots are technically, like, also City of Columbia. Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing if you're a commuter and you have a spot, but also you're guaranteed the spot in the first place. So I think it's helpful for students like me where, like, I live off campus and I take a bus. But sometimes the bus isn't running or it's late and I need to get home. So I drive. Mm -hmm. There are so, only three garages in it right now. So there's the 650 Lincoln Garage and Pendleton Street and the Senate Street Garage. I'm like, that's that's it for now. But it is still in the planning phase. So are they checking to see, like, so if someone puts, like, you have to have the app to put in that you're in a spot. So we can say the garage is empty because no one has the app and is inputting that they're in the garage and really the, the garage is full. So that's the other thing is the way that the app works is by crowdsourcing. So basically you put in your information and it uses that to give, to put all the information together and then put out a bunch of data. So obviously the more people that use the app, the more accurate it's going to be, which also, again, yeah, it's like, how do they know if a spot's open, if somebody doesn't have the app, like, and I'm sure maybe there's like a bunch of, I guess, like technology behind it for worst case if nobody, if not a lot of people download it, but I don't know. I feel like this wouldn't be student. Like I think, like I think it's the idea is great. I think students aren't going to be pulling out their app while they're rushing to class trying to find a parking spot to fill out for other people to know if parking's like full or not. And this is another thing though, because if a bunch of people are on their phones while they're driving trying to find a parking spot, because we know that that's what's going to end up happening. Yeah. Yikes. And Not safe. We all know South Carolina College drivers, me included. Not the best. <laughs> it's rough out there. Yeah, it is. I'm scared. So I just refreshed the app, and so this I think is what it's supposed to look like. So I I, I zoomed in like the baseball stadium area, and there's little like icons where all the surrounding parking zones are, and there's like like the icon shows. Like, like this one, it says, like, highly available would be the point. So theoretically, the app would know whether the lot that you're going to park in, like, whether it's worth your time to, like, zoom around it looking for a spot, which is cool. So it seems like it's not like this is the amount of spots we have left. It just gives you a general highly available, some availability. But the only way that they would know that is through the people that have the app. And what's the, the chances that 
you know, every student that's going to go park in the Bull Street Garage, what are the chances that they all have the app? That's not going to happen. Right. It's low, but if most of them do, then I think that it can end up being pretty accurate. Well, do you think do you think students use other transportation apps now? Like, do you think students use the bus apps a lot? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I think so. It would be cool <laughs> if there was some kind of technology where when you're coming in and out of the parking lot, it can count how many cars are entering and leaving and that's being input input into the app. I think that would make more and more accurate, but I mean, right now it's like you said, it's crowdsourcing. That would be cool. I I know I know parking lots that has that technology, so it will like sell you full, almost full. That's cool. I don't know if USC is on that level. <laughs> I kind of doubt yet. it. Not yet. We don't even I have mean, enough park in. All we can do is, I guess, just test it out. Hopefully, st- enough students. I I honestly am kind of. I would encourage. I think most USC students to download it because I would like to know whether. It ends up working, but we'll see. Yeah. I agree. Do you well, have any insight on how successful it's been on other campuses? According to the LSU's website, they did a test launch for the law school parking lots before they launched it for the whole school, which resulted in, quote, a total of 251 downloads and about 100 daily active users just for those lots, which showed them that students not associated with the law school oh so students not associated with the law school also downloaded the app and also input their data so i would say word spread pretty fast and that it did end up being successful like for the most part so hopefully word spreads i mean i'm sure as soon as students realize that there's a parking app they're going to download it considering how long we've been complaining about this i feel like this like anything just any kind of band-aid for this wound will be taken with a lot of enthusiasm yeah absolutely yeah i think it's great um i do know that there is a program in the business school where you get to you get assigned to different um companies to work on fix solving a problem in their company and i know the students that worked on us parking helped with this app this past semester so it's cool to see that the students were involved too to bring this to campus because it's a pretty big campus issue so another great thing from columbia we're going to see all over the tvs make sure you keep an eye on the paris 2024 olympics because you might see some familiar gamecock faces competing this is so exciting i'm so excited for this i'm big into the olympics i took the summer olympic class last semester at the school i have done a segment on the winter olympics if you guys saw that freshman year three years ago four years ago now so this summer we have three gamecocks competing so far that we've heard to in the olympics and we've had 20 gamecocks compete in at least an olympic trial the olympic trials were between like swimming diving track we had a lot of gamecocks competing in track for the olympic trials which is cool But one former Gamecock made it to the Olympics for track. His name is Quincy Hall. He's a former Gamecock track athlete from 2019 to 2020. He ran sprints and hurdles of the 400 meter. It's going to be his first Olympic appearance. He actually ran his personal best at the Olympic trials this past weekend or this past weekend. Yeah, I actually watched them. They were really good. It was great seeing the athletes getting, you know, back and ready for the Olympics. So it was his fastest time, 44.17 seconds in the 400 meter, which is really fast. He won the trial final. And it's also the fastest time by an American this year. So I would love to see what he's going to be able to do in the Olympics. In 2023, he also won gold for the 2023 Budapest World Championships in the 4x40 relay, or the 4x, yeah, 4x40 relay, and then the bronze in 400 meters. So Quincy Hall has a pretty stacked record, former Gamecock. I'm excited to see see him compete. I think track's a really fun sport to watch during the Olympics. I feel like track usually gets not the, it doesn't get the attention it deserves because people think it's just easy. It's just running. And, you know, there's more sports that are, you know, hard or whatever. I disagree. I go out on a run and I feel like I'm going to die. Running is hard. Clay, you don't need to realize that. Words, I don't think anybody's ever said the words running is easy. No. <laughs> I have this thing where, like, this is my personal threshold that I am impressed by anything that I cannot do. 
regardless of objectively how impressive it is. So I'm incredibly impressed with anyone who can run well because I don't even really walk all that well, honestly. I trip over <laughs> stuff all the time. So 44 seconds in the 400 meter, that's not slow. No. I mean, I don't know how someone can possibly run that fast, but good for him. Hopefully he brings in a goal. That'd be great news for USA. Great news for, you know, game country. So I'm excited to see him compete, especially because it's his first Olympics. So that's always exciting for an athlete. The next athlete we have is Thomas Peribonio. He is a former Gamecock swim athlete from 2014 to 2018, and he's heading to Paris with his home country of Ecuador. He competed at the 2020 Olympic swimming in the Paris, uh, Tokyo 2020 for the men's 200 meter individual medley and 400 meter medley. He, while he was at USC, he received all American honors from the NCAA all for your years while he was at USC, which is a pretty good award. So like it's given to the athletes who are considered the best of their sport. So for him to get it four years in a row is pretty awesome. I'm excited to see what he's going to do for his country in Ecuador. And if he's going to win anything, he didn't win anything last time, but maybe he's trained harder and worked to get, you know, a medal this time. I know that along with players from our school going to their home countries to compete. I know that Camila Cardoso, her team did not fail to obtain quota for Paris 2024. Camila Cardoso, Brazil in general, will not be going competing in basketball for the 2024 Paris Olympics because their team did not qualify. Mm-hmm. But kind of stinks for her. I would love to see that. I'd love to see Camila at the Olympics one day. Maybe next next year, not next year, next four years, we'll see her. Speaking of basketball, though, Asia Wilson, one of the most iconic Gamecock basketball stars to come from University of South Carolina, is competing on the basketball team this year. It's her second Olympics. Um, she brought the she brought the Gamecock team to a 2017 national championship win, and she also brought the the USA team in Tokyo 2020 to a gold win. So I think that. Her participation with her team is great, and she works. I mean, she works her butt off. She's a great athlete. I think she can bring home another gold for USA. Yeah, I'm. I'm really excited to see her. And also, something about the Tokyo 2020 Olympics is that Don Staley coached them to that gold medal. So, I don't know. South yeah. Carolina just we're built we, different. We own basketball. I mean, at this point, we've been we've been killing it. Some of Asia Wilson's stats from the 2020 Olympics and her current WNBA stats at the Olympics in 2020, she averaged 16.5 points, 7.3 rebounds, and 1 point blocks per game. She's up to that. Right now, her WNBA stats are 27.8 points, 11.6 rebounds, and 2.4 blocks per game. Granted, the Olympic stats are smaller on a smaller base of um, games, but still, her stats right now are really looking good. And I'm I'm so excited to watch her compete. I'm I'm pretty upset that Dawn's not coaching the team this year. I really thought she would, um, but not not this year. Unfortunately, we won't see her at the Olympics in Paris. I still believe in that women's basketball team, though. Like, man, we it's stacked. There's just it's going to be a powerhouse team no matter what. I think it's so cool just seeing how also just how Asia Wilson has become like such a public figure. Like, obviously, she's, like, renowned basketball player, but also, like, I think she just came out with her book. I think Dear Black Girls, she just came out with her book, Dear Black Girls. She got, this is something I find really, really awesome, but she got listed on Time Magazine's most influential, like, 100 most influential people for 2024, which is so cool. cool. That's cool. Seeing her success, like, coming from South Carolina, like, I just think it's so great. She's also from Columbia, South Carolina. She grew up in Columbia, went to the University of South Carolina. She is born and raised. That's really cool. I'm not much of an Olympics watcher. Like, I don't usually watch the Olympics. But now I feel like I have a tie to it. So I feel, oh, Megan's giving me a really big side eye. No, you have to watch them. They're so great. I They're used to so watch, great. I used to watch, like, the swimming. Like, I would watch Michael Phelps. Swimming. But other than that, I didn't really... I didn't really have much interest. I don't know. I was just kind of bored by it. I'm almost with you. It's I. It's not that I don't like the Olympics. It's just that I do think that I prefer the winter ones. 
Me too. Oh, I love watching I the, the, the skiing. The cross-country skiing, I love watching. I like curling, which is such yeah. a bad take objectively. Like, Delaney's already laughing, but that is my like, favorite Olympic sport. Like, I feel like I can watch basketball all the time. Like, to be fair, this is probably the best possible women's basketball team that the United States collectively could possibly have put together when that's what makes it cool. Yeah. Carolyn, you seem like a person that would really like watching curling. I love curling. <laughs> But well, like, do you remember the so curling you. team for it was it two Olympic games ago? The curling team was just some guys. Like they were like just some guys who played curling and like won gold. They were just dudes. Yeah, yeah because it's just so <laughs> random. That's what's cool about the Olympics is the total randomness of it. But I think I read isn't um like breakdancing? Isn't that an Olympic sport breaking. for this year? That's this year. It's called breaking. Awesome. I don't know how exactly they're gonna do the scoring for that, but I think it's cool to see a new sport coming in and it being dancing. Is gymnastics summer? Yes. yes. So we, yeah, got some on Biles. we got some on Biles coming back. Olympic trials are actually this weekend for gymnastics. So keep an eye on that. See who makes the team. I hope we see someone back. I think we will. Um, I'm sure we will. Especially after what happened last games. I think she might bring in the gold again this year. So. Yeah, I think if- gymnastics and swimming are my like two favorites. I always wake up in the morning and watch cycling. <laughs> You know, you are right. I do have these, like, vivid memories of my dad coming into my room early in the morning and, like, turning on the Olympics. It just yeah. being a random thing, you know? <laughs> like, a random event, like cycling or something like that. But if you guys could pick anything to be an Olympic sport, what would it be? Ping pong. Isn't that already an Olympic sport? Already sport? Is it already one? My yeah. China sure dominates is. ping pong year after year. They're so good. I love ping pong. That's awesome. Yes. That's ping- oh, it's called table tennis in the oh, Olympics. That's, oh, that's oh excuse me. Oh. <laughs> you got to get it right. Ping pong is just for us amateurs. Table they tennis is the real deal. The, they should put me on the USA table tennis team because I'm really good at Wii table tennis. <laughs> <laughs> like, they should they should put me on. Let I me will play. I will say one thing that the Olympics used to have was an arts and culture section. So they would judge pottery, art, all those kinds of things. But it got taken out years and years ago, like hundreds of years ago, it got taken out because it was the Olympics originally was only supposed to be amateurs. Right now, obviously, we see that the United States, again, started letting professional athletes play in the Olympics. They used to not be able to back in, you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s. But they had that issue that there wasn't a lot of amateurs in art, and it was hard to judge who was an amateur in that. And it also was really hard to judge how to score. What was the scoring basis for those kinds of things? Because art can be seen in a lot of different ways. That would be cool to see something brought back. I know that not too long ago, it was like 60s, when Germany had the Olympics after World War II, they did a scoring based on their like Olympic Park, the way they, they they did something with that, and they got they got some kind of medal for the way their Olympic Park was built, which is kind of just they kind of gave it to themselves. But cool, cool story. You know, something else that was an I don't know if this is still an Olympic sport, and we're going back, we're switching back to winter. But there was this thing called ski ballet. Has anyone heard of this? No. Yes. Was it ballet on skis. That's literally exactly what it is. You're on skis, but instead of like skiing down a mountain they're like dancing on the skis it's re- it looks so difficult actually it's like a kind of an 80s thing right oh it like seems 80s. like it it seems like something that would have been born out of jazzercise <laughs> yeah <laughs> do they do it in the leotards it was they were i mean they were very neon things back there so it kind of looks like it but they were still in snowsuits freestyle ballet skiing Wow. The music. The music. She's in a leotard. She's in a leotard with leg warmers. <laughs> I'm looking at a picture right now. Someone with a leotard and leg warmers. <laughs> That's crazy. Wow. Yeah, it does kind of look like ice skating. But like six snow so skating. Weird. How do they control their skis so well? Viewers at home, please look up ski ballet and just look at the pictures of it. It's really, it's incredible. Yeah. I would love That's to see something that else. be brought back. I think that would be pretty cool. So, yeah, we're all definitely excited for the Olympics. These come at the end of July, right? July 26th, they start? Yes. Mm-hmm. Opening so ceremonies. 
coming up. Everybody mark their calendars. Yeah, I'm super excited. Um, and I guess we, we might update you when we get back to campus on how, how our athletes do. And to keep you busy from now until then, we once again have an update on the Murdoch family. I feel like for South Carolina journalists and reporters, this family is just the gift that keeps on giving. Because Are we sick of them or are we? do we depend on them for fodder for our newspapers? I feel like we depend on them. I mean, I there's been several a Murdoch story since we've started this show. Anywho, Buster Murdoch is suing Netflix, Warner Brothers Discovery, and other large media companies for defamation. He states that these companies, along with others, have falsely implied in several of their documentaries and films about the Murdoch family that Buster murdered a teenager in 2015. So this is some heavy, heavy stuff. Let's take it. Let's let's take a couple steps back and let's explain the situation. There was a homosexual teenager that was mysteriously murdered in 2015, and it was somehow connected to the Murdoch family. Like there were rumors that went around that, oh, maybe the Murdochs are involved in this because you know people think they're a shady family anyway. It all came to a head when the Murdoch case reached its peak. Its peak back in March of 2023, when Alec was finally convicted for murder. And I guess Buster's just getting around to it now, but he's gotten a lot of hate for it, and so he's suing these documentary companies. I mean, there's been dozens of documentaries and films made about the Murdoch family, so. The Murdoch family has kind of come down like Enron in the last two years, where it was like somebody dug something up, and they were like, hmm. That's weird. And they looked into it a little more. And then you find like five more things that are weird. And then you look into that. And then you find 35 more things that are weird. And then you're like, this is like, it's just like all these other, you know, horrible, almost murder cases that happen in Hollywood, where it's like, there's, there's not enough evidence, but like, no one can confirm or deny, but like, we can. Mm. But you can't, you know? Yeah. So, so what do you... I understand why he would be suing Netflix over these documentaries, but also, like, buddy, quit while you're behind. What I guess I don't understand is, like, I I get that he's suing them for, like, implying, I guess, that it happened, but it's not like they're saying that he did. You know, like, I feel like suing them... I don't know. This This is what gets me, is that he's suing them for defamation, which means he's saying that... His, his reputation is permanently tarnished by these documentaries. That's totally However, true. However, it's true, but wasn't his reputation already tarnished with the fact that his father killed his mother and his brother and that's that he's part of this family? Isn't that already enough? Yeah, but that's no. indirect, though. Like, at this point, like, Buster Murdoch specifically is now heavily associated with the death of this teenager that, like, and it's because of these murder documentaries. Like, he can't help anything that happened in his father's trial over the last couple of years. Like, yeah, that's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna tarnish your public image. But these documentary companies are like directly implying him, his role in this crime. Mm-hmm. I see where he's coming from. It's, it seems a little extreme, but also like, defamation's a big deal yeah yeah that's yeah. true i just think it's interesting that i mean could the document not the documentary companies the media companies could the media companies get in trouble for making this implication and it being falsely stated we well, yeah, have that just goes against all kinds of journalistic integrity however is it illegal i kind, kind of in doubt it making an implication would yeah, is being unethical the same thing as being illegal? And the answer is only sometimes. I guess what also gets me is like because I mean I didn't watch. I, I'm a bad judge for this because I don't know exactly what these media companies and like what Netflix said. Because I feel like if you're just presenting that this thing happened, and just talking about something that happened, and just mentioning like all the people that were believed to be involved. It's not necessarily defamation, but if you're like, I don't know, I feel like implying is a very specific thing to have, you have to prove. Yeah. I also feel like it's the job of a journalist to kind of dig up these, these facts and make these implications and set out these opinions to see if there is something there. 
You understand what I mean? You know, like right. this, like making that that guess is kind of the first step to solving something. That's how that's how all this other stuff came out to begin with. You know, Murdoch's tax, uh, no, Murdoch's um financial fraud and stuff like that. It was just like the the digging that started it. So I guess. I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't think the the documentary companies are necessarily in the wrong for not stirring up this rumor, but making this judgment if it's backed by, you know, significant evidence and circumstantial and, evidence. There's a yeah. lot. Like, however, the, on the same token, I understand where Buster's coming from. Right. You know, like the the whole Murdoch family regardless of what they have done or have not done, because at this point there's just a whole slew of lawsuits all over them and all these conversations. And this is just a drop in the bucket, but the, they, they've kind of, they've turned themselves into an easy target to be suspected in stuff like this. And it's, it's just unfortunate all around really. This is off topic, but didn't they, didn't he, didn't he go to university of South Carolina? Don't claim that. No, he did. I think the whole family did. He did, yeah. Yeah, I think actually Buster got kicked out because of plagiarism. I mean... And that's according to the state. Are we surprised? Like, Um, when it comes to this family, there's just always something else, you know? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's for journalists, this is the gift that keeps on giving. Because there's always something extra with this family. There's always something that's going on. Yeah, it's like the the trial that we just had, like throughout all, like go back to like so many SGTV student news at seven episodes. Oh, the Alec trial reported on because he was like an he was an attorney, right? Until he was no longer allowed to be an attorney due to stealing stuff. Yes, that I just that's so ironic when an attorney is on the other side of the transaction. It's just. Funny is not the right word. Ironic Uno is the right word. Yeah, an Uno reverse card. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, honestly, like, even though, you know, as as journalists, it's always, like, it's exciting to see, like, another piece of news, like, for us to talk about. And I feel like South Carolinians are just eating this up, like, back, back porch gossip. But actually, to take a step back and, like, to see story after story, you, I, I, I almost, like, feel bad for this family. Oh, I feel bad for for Buster. I feel like he was just put, he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, you know? But you can't feel bad for Alec. I just feel like people aren't born with the desire to, like, commit embezzlement and murder their family. You know, like, something, like, a lot of stuff went wrong in this guy's life to, like, lead him. I'm not laughing to be disrespectful. Like, it's just so... There's, it's just so much. Literally, it's just this mountain of, like, stuff to sift through. I'm like, how did it go so wrong? Yeah. Like, situation after situation. Like, how long had they been in court for? Like, a f- like almost a year. Like, you know, I, I get what you're saying. You, it, it is hard to comprehend how all of this torment landed on one family. Let's move on from Colleton County where let's leave the Murdaws behind and let's go a little closer to the coast and let's talk about some unwelcome visitors who may be joining us on our beaches, especially this weekend for the 4th of July. So it is it is officially summer here in South Carolina. Um, Woohoo. The, uh, mm, yeah. You say that, but you are in New York right now, my friend. You are not suffering Woo-hoo. the way I'm suffering. <laughs> So the summer solstice officially marked the beginning of the summer season on June 20th. So from now on, days will get shorter. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not going to say yay to that because I really like good old long summer days. But the summer season has rolled in with some fury this year here in Columbia. The heat index has soared to reach the low hundreds every day. It was 101 today in Columbia. Yikes. And um, on Monday, it felt like 106. Oh, so that's, that's also, uncomfortable. It's just so bad. Like it's so humid. And this is what the heat index is. The heat index is how hot it feels, not how hot it is. But the heat index is it's a little more important when you're trying to plan for your day. This is an important difference to keep in mind that what it feels like outside affects how quickly you become affected by temperatures so the heat index is what affects how quickly you become heat exhausted not the actual temperature so 
if it says that it's 92, but it feels like 105, prepare for 105 because that's really what your day is going to be like. So with the big holiday weekend coming up for the 4th and people are going to be outside barbecuing by the pool on the beach, be careful because it is going to be really, really, really hot. So everybody, sunscreen, stay hydrated, all that jazz, take care of yourselves. So it's really hot here in the Midlands. Um, well, we're pretty used to it here in Colombia, at least. Like, we don't like it, but we saw it coming, you know. But it is no secret to pretty much everybody that summers are getting worse everywhere. And global warming is affecting pretty much everybody at this point, usually negatively. But there is one creature out there that is loving all these carbon emissions and rising ocean temperatures, and that's jellyfish. Do you all have opinions on jellyfish? Because... None. <laughs> Great. I'm going to give you some opinions on I jellyfish. I don't want to get stung by them. You know what? Then don't go to Folly Beach this weekend. So if you're like me and you're planning on hitting the beach for the 4th, um, you should know that in just the past couple of days, a lot of headlines have come out. Pretty much every local news source from Colombia to the coast has talked about how Portuguese man of war jellyfish have been spotted off the beaches of South Carolina. Wait, hold on. Time out. Portuguese jellyfish? As well, in well, from they're... Portugal in Europe? No, they are not from Portugal. They are called, so they're, they're man of war jellyfish. They're also, technically, they're not jellyfish. So let's break down this name. What the heck are these things? They are not Portuguese. They are native to tropical waters around the world. They're called Portuguese man of war because they, they have really long tendrils and they balloon out. They're really big. And when they're filled up with water in the ocean, they look like the sails of Portuguese warships. So this is where the name came from. It's what they look like, not where they're from. Oh, my goodness. Okay. And it's also of note that they are not jellyfish. Technically, they're from a different, um, ooh, I don't know, like, it's not species. It's, like, higher up on the, the classification list than that. Probably higher up than that. Techn I don't know. This might be a class. Um, oh, they're okay. not jellyfish. Technically, they're called something, they're siphonophores. And I don't really know how to tell you exactly what that is. They're closely related to jellyfish, but jellyfish are like one creature. And a siphonophore is made up of multiple kinds of individual organisms that come together to make some cohesive creature. No way. So so this animal is like, like literally this animal is like the blob from elementary it's gym. made up of multiple genetically different pieces. That's crazy. But for all intents and purposes, and for the rest of what I'm talking about, we'll continue to refer to them as jellyfish because in the way they behave and to normal people, that's what makes the most sense. So watch out for these. It's pretty scary that we're seeing them off the coast of South Carolina because they're like super poisonous. You won't die, but you will really, really hate being stung by one. They are way more painful than like the moon get jellies or the cannonball jellyfish that we're used to seeing in South Carolina. I will say that these jellyfish are still able to sting out of water. So be careful of that as well. When I went on spring break mm, two years ago, I went to the Gulf, and the Gulf is full of men of war jellyfish. And they were they were all over the place, washing up on the shore, and people were trying to touch them. And I was, we were like, oh my gosh, don't touch them. That's going to really hurt. Because they are still, you can still get stung by them um, out of water. That is so true. Yes, they're the dead jellyfish that wash up on the beach can still sting you. But I get why people would want to touch them because they're beautiful. They're huge and they're like pink and purple and blue. They're gorgeous. But do not, they're not your friend. Do not touch them. Yeah, I'm looking at like, I'm just scrolling. I'm just looking at pictures right now. And they're like kind of actually so freaky. They're freaky. Yeah. And when you think about the fact that they're not jellyfish, they're this siphonophoric kind of animal. They're, it's just... Go down that rabbit hole on your own time, guys, because I got a little weirded out and stopped researching the it. The ocean is too big. The ocean is too big. More specifically, the ocean is too hot, and that's why we're seeing more of these. So the warming ocean, since these are native to tropical areas, the warmer the ocean is, the more area we have to have, like, poisonous jellyfish be all over the place. All of the... So it's a combination of, like, global... It's... So climate change is affecting the ocean in two really important ways right now. And jellyfish in general are pretty immune to both of these changes. So the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas. And greenhouse gases lead to warming. And when the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide, not only does it grow warmer, but the more carbon dioxide the ocean absorbs, the less oxygen it can hold. 
and this is not good for ocean life because just like animals above ground ocean creatures also need oxygen to live they just breathe differently than we do so when there's less oxygen in the ocean there's less life in the ocean too but jellyfish have adaptations to allow them to absorb and retain oxygen over time and to like ration it in themselves so they're built tougher they don't really need to breathe as much so they are unaffected by a poorly oxygenated ocean so that's cool i guess um and the second way that climate change is affecting the ocean is that um when the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide I haven't taken chemistry since 2018, so don't ask me too many questions about this, but some sort of chemical reaction happens that results in hydrogen ions in the water, which makes the ocean more acidic. So creatures that make shells or have like hard body parts or exoskeletons or anything like that, it, an, acidic at, an acidic environment makes it a lot more difficult for that part of these creatures to function. But jellyfish oh. don't have shells, so they don't care. <laughs> And that's actually why the coral reefs are dying. That is why the coral reefs are dying. And to, to piggyback off of that, pretty much every natural predator that a jellyfish has needs the ocean to not be acidic, including coral reefs, crabs, crustaceans, turtles, all these like hard creatures. These are, this, these are the things that eat or kill jellyfish. And with fewer predators, now the jellyfish population is a little bit out of control. Yikes. Point is, watch out when you go to the beach, because I know that a lot of people in South Carolina are going to hit the coast this week, and there's probably going to be a whole lot of people who are not feeling good after getting wrapped up in a jellyfish. So keep your yeah. eyes peeled, everybody. No, I just, I looked know? up a picture of this. They're, they're massive. They're, they're really huge. big. Mm -hmm. They're tendrils. They're like the, the jelly part, the tentacles. Thank you. Um, I just did something really weird with my hands to try to explain what that was. <laughs> the tentacles of a Portuguese man of war can get like, they can be like 30 feet long. These things are big. Don't get wrapped up in one of those. I'm you sick. never get it off. I'm sick. I'm <laughs> terrified. <laughs> no, I'm like so scared. Like, I don't know. So the ocean, like what freaks me out about the ocean is like the sunken ships and the, the man-made stuff that's just under there. Like, I think it's called like some mechanophobia that's what i have i can't We've do talked it. about this on gmg before we have it makes me want to throw up like i can't I, but also like any like creature like my brain just can't like i can deal with like like sharks sea turtles like coral like none of that freaks me out but like the long jellyfish and the the weird one the weird things i'm not i can't i can't do it um, I am very scared of jellyfish. I will admit that of all the things in the ocean, that's probably the thing I'm most afraid of because I won't go into the ocean like past my knees. I do not know how to swim. I, I'm afraid of the ocean. And really, it's because I'm afraid of jellyfish. Wait, you can't swim? I do not know how to swim. I can like survive in a pool, but I, if I get caught in a rip current, I'm done for. Are you serious? Well, we can teach you. If you're you. in a rip current, you have to, to swim parallel to the beach if anyone knows that if you're if going you to the beach this weekend boat, you have to swim, swim parallel of the beach don't swim inland to the beach swim parallel how about just don't swim into a rip tide like stay don't don't go out there there's jellyfish out there we just covered this i will say i i live on the shore back home when i'm not in south carolina and new jersey and i've been going to the beach a few times this summer I think because the water's been warming up, we've been having lots of wildlife here. I saw, like, tons of packs of dolphins um, last Saturday or last Sunday. I actually watched one jump out of the water and jump back in. The whole beach started clapping. Um, <laughs> yeah, because awesome. you're, you're, going, you're going to the Jersey Shore, right? You're going to the Jersey yeah, Shore beaches? Yeah, I live on the Jersey Shore. Yeah, they're getting all of the, the media attention because it's supposed to be absolutely gorgeous there. Yeah, and we the water has been so crystal clear here. And then also I saw a whale the other day, which was really cool. The beach also started clapping for the whale. And I saw it blow out of his, its little, like, like water out its blowhole. That was pretty cool. So. That's beautiful. That's yeah, it's awesome. really nice. Yeah. Well, I know people, because I, because, you know, I, I'm very close to beaches, too. I live on an island. So, you know, there's beaches all around you. But I know quite a few people that drove to the Jersey Shore just to see like the condition of those beaches because it's supposed to be totally beautiful yeah it's i would say since i i mean when i the beaches were pretty rough after uh, superstorm sandy hit but 
it's been a long time since then. And like you can see year after year, they keep getting cleaner, which is awesome. So I love to see that in my hometown. Yeah. Well, it's the, almost the end of our third podcast episode, but this wouldn't be a Good Morning Gamecocks without a fun food fact. So let's hear it, Megan. What are we talking about today? Today is National Food Truck Day. And you know we love food trucks here in South Carolina, especially in Columbia. We have them on campus. We got them at Soda City. And SGTV loves them as well. I'm missing the Belgian waffle truck right now. Mm. I love the Belgian waffle so, truck. I've actually good. never been to the Belgian waffle truck. You're missing out. Skill, we I gotta know. Go. I know. I really need to. I really need to. They do I punch like, cards. Do they really? For a free waffle. I think I lost my punch card though. Uh, oh. I had yeah, a punch card too. I like the breakfast, John. That's and it's like student run, but that is my personal favorite. Like last spring, I think I ate at the breakfast, John, almost every day the whole semester. <laughs> Aren't the guys that run Breakfast John the same people that are in that band that's like always playing at like third floor? bars around campus? Third floor? Is that what it is? A third floor was is it one really? of the bands. Was third floor from me and Caroline's freshman year? Or was that from y'all's freshman year or Delaney, your freshman year? I want to say my freshman year, but I'm not sure. Because yeah. ours was Sister Garage. Well, that, they were seniors. We had a band that started our freshman year. They were in Capstone. And I want to say it was third floor. So maybe it's a different I band. Know. I love to see bands being created on campus, though. So, I really like the Arepa truck. Arepa truck. Oh, has, okay. I don't know how to say it. I will say, uh, I got the Arepa truck uh, when I went to Soto City once, and I waited in line for, like, 30 minutes. So I really liked it. It was, it was good. good. I, was just, I was upset I had to wait 30 minutes. But it was, it was worth the wait. <laughs> and then, have you guys ever tried the, uh, the coupe? That's Not only no. there when like the um the new students are there. I had it like um at New Students Day or something like that. It's really good. It's uh like burgers and chicken burgers, bur- burgers, <laughs> chicken burgers and stuff like that. It's pretty good. It's not Does bad. anyone know if they still have nacho poppies? That no, that doesn't exist anymore. The Breakfast John bought their truck. Oh, interesting. Yeah, but I never had it, but I heard it was good. The coop food truck is usually at the zoo. Huh. The zoo? Yeah, like the riverbanks. Wow. That's Weird. random. It is kind of random, but it's cool. Yeah. Um. Do you guys all, uh, Caroline, you would remember this. Do you remember Good Uncle from our freshman year? Yes. <laughs> I loved Good Uncle. I was a Good Uncle fan. Good Uncle was this, like, delivery food truck where they made the food and delivered it to your, your dorm. Um, but you can only use, like, Carolina cash, like, kind of, like, bucks on it. No, no meal swipes, but... The driver was awesome. He had, like, neon lights blasting music. I kind of was embarrassed every time I got food, but you know what? He was having a ball, and I loved the enthusiasm. Have any of y'all ever ridden in the Soda City Trap Wagon? No, I <laughs> want you so bad! <laughs> he stopped doing it, I think. No! Really? Britain, what is this? it's a it's green like a soul, <laughs> and it's, like, has Polaroid pictures of all the people that have, like, driven in his car it's like an uber and he has like neon lights everywhere but um and then he like lets you have ox and it's this guy named Britton, and he's like the sweetest man you've ever met in your life like i think he's got like two kids like a wife that's cool like, he's so sweet yeah oh my god like, i think there's a picture of me on the instagram somewhere loki <laughs> that's so funny but he's lovely and if y'all ever get the chance to you should Britton is a lovely man all right so National Food Truck Day, go support your, support your small business food trucks. They're always great. And honestly, sometimes I think the food's better in a food truck when it, and besides a restaurant. So I'll be hitting up a food truck today. Um, I don't know about you guys. But with that, we wrap up Good Morning Gamecocks as well for June 28th, 2024. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, X, and Facebook at SGTV at USC. To keep up with all of our content, be sure to also visit us online at SGTV at USC.com. For SGTV, I'm Delaney Flanagan. I'm Chloe Finley. I'm Megan Dalkshus. And I'm Caroline Smith. From all of us here at SGTV, have a great weekend, Carolina. Forever to be.